マネー What your bank doesn't tell you. A podcast by you mushroom. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to our podcast, What Your Bank Doesn't Tell You. This week, we have another special situation given with the situation around Credit Suisse. So, in this podcast, we would like to elaborate very briefly what happened with Credit Suisse and especially during the last days of the existence of Credit Suisse. And then, in more detail, we would like to explain you what really happened inside Credit Suisse. As you might know, Luba and I, we share a very long history with Credit Suisse and we believe we have some insights which we can reveal in this podcast. Um, good morning, everyone, and happy to welcome you to our new podcast. What we're going to start with is why did Credit Suisse end up in the situation where it is currently being taken overnight by UBS under the request of the Swiss National Bank and the government? Of course, in the last week of the existence of Credit Suisse, the company was big time in the news. But there was a big difference also in comparison to other bank failures in the past, because Credit Suisse was fulfilling the regulatory requirements and all the ratios required until Friday before the, the big weekend in this sense. And therefore also the government or, or FINMA, the regulator, didn't jump in before this special weekend. And actually there were kind of rumors what happened over the weekend. But, but what we learn from press is that basically Credit Suisse raised their hand and was begging for, for support over the weekend. And that's the reason why the Swiss National Bank, the Swiss government and also FINMA, the Swiss regulator actually jumped in and was looking for a solution with UBS. That is true. And also what was interesting was, as you probably have heard already, uh, prior to this very, um, important and very crucial historical weekend, uh, Credit Suisse was losing roughly 10 billion uh, Swiss francs on clan money per day. And as we can see, not everything is done with fulfilling the capital requirements. Crucial is the trust of the, of the clients, of the private and institutional clients. In this case of Credit Suisse, the trust has been completely wiped out. This is a very important point and exactly also the reason why then all the, all, all the government entities together with UBS jumped in over the weekend. And for the government, we assume it was important that not the government is taking over the bank as, as in 2008, what happened with UBS back then. So they were looking for a solution and, and UBS... I assume they kind of offered to take over Credit Suisse. But in this step, they also got a, a couple of guarantees by the government. So first of all, the government was or is actually backing part of the potential losses out of a out of a pool of assets, which UBS has taken over from Credit Suisse. So if the losses of this package of assets actually exceeds a certain amount, then the government will jump in with a 9 billion Swiss franc guarantee. That's one measure which was taken. Um, the other measures are to, and we know that prior to this measure, there was already a 50 billion Swiss francs credit line offered liquidity um, coverage offered to um, Credit Suisse. In addition, the two other measures are 100 billion Swiss francs credit line covered by uh, the guarantee of the Bund to Credit Suisse and another 100 billion credit line given to both banks, which actually has um, priority treatment in a potential case of default. So in total, we can say that there is a liquidity of roughly 209 billion Swiss francs put in the system in order to support the new bank. So this is basically the summary of all the support the government has given to Credit Suisse. But I'm sure you can read this in plenty of articles and also watch it on TV. But I think we move over to, to the second part and give you all the insights what in our opinion really happened over the past 15 years with Credit Suisse. And in this respect, we must not forget that in 2008, when we had the big financial crisis, Credit Suisse was actually one of the very few global banks which didn't require any government support. So the big question is, what happened in between? It's a very good question. Given that both Tonya and I have worked for the bank, 
we had to experience firsthand what a culture means for a company and what is the biggest and the most important production resource of a bank in that case. As we know, a bank is not producing any kind of materials. They're not producing table chairs or chocolate or they're producing services. And in any service providing company, the most important are the people and the culture. And on that, we can tell a lot mm. what went wrong. I mean, in Credit Suisse, it's most likely like with other companies. You you have a very nice, glossy overview of all the values which are relevant for the company. But in the case of Credit Suisse, I would dare to say that most of the people, they didn't know what's written on this glossy paper in respect to values, because the values, they were not really present in the in the company culture. People, they didn't live these values. And I even dare to say that management didn't live these values. And given this lack of of values, yes, in the end, it was also very difficult to establish a, a sustainable company culture. And the company culture was more related to short-term profits or or how to improve individual positions of certain of certain people. It's true. And given the compensation structure which we have in place in, in a lot of banks and in the banking system, such a compensation structure actually encourages man, top management to take risks, to take short-term risks. And um, another bigger question is how are the risk taking, uh, the risk controlling bodies functioning, because it's good to take risks. It's okay sometimes to take short term risk. The question is, are there the necessary alarming mechanism in place if things turn sour to respectively cut losses or exit a trade? And to that, we've seen that in Credit Suisse particularly, there are excellent credit monitoring systems. There are excellent teams, very well educated, yet signals which are alarming can be easily overwritten by the by the management in that sense. In the end, also as entrepreneurs, we know that each single business decision also means to take a certain risk. And taking risk is not per se something bad. It's it's part of the business. Otherwise, you don't get anywhere without any risk. It's almost impossible to make any money. But the motivation why you take risks can be completely different. So if I if I take risk or take a business decision in the interest of the company because I believe it's the best decision midterm, then that's kind of sensible or kind of natural. But if I take a decision and take risk because it improves the position of one single manager of, or of one single department because they it might boost their revenues short term, then it's definitely, I mean, a decision which might hurt the company midterm or definitely long term. Yes, and what is also very important is, and we see that as an entrepreneur, and you're raising a very important point, what's the difference between being an entrepreneur and actually being employed by such a big organization? And I've always wondered, when, when I was in banking, is um, if you hire people and don't let them do their work or don't let them show what they know, um, don't really fool them, run with their talents, obviously within the necessary legal and uh, regulatory boundaries, then actually it's very pity because you're not deploying the full capacity of human capital which you're hiring. We're seeing that now here in the company, what it is to work with a pool of talents and how good it is to see the fruits when, when you let them run and obviously just only providing guidelines and frame, but other than that, not putting any boundaries to their opinions, even if they're sometimes very opposite to what we think. It's important to let people tell you what is best sometimes. Maybe it's even the people who run a company not necessarily always know that. And if you cut those voices, which happens naturally in big organization, it's actually a very, it's very dangerous dynamic, right? It's extremely dangerous. And, and I believe this point is extremely important in the sense that if you, if you cut these voices because they are annoying, because they might disturb a, a personal agenda of somebody, then the system is actually called to collapse at some point because you don't have this very sound corrective mechanism to to bring the company or the interests aligned again to the to the mid or long term long term interests. Yeah. And one other thing which comes with that is also the reorganizations in a bank. And I'm not sure how it was during your time at Credit Suisse, but during the years I was there, I believe we had a reorganization almost every year. 
And yeah, again, it was a hobby. Yeah, it was <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and reorganization per oh. se, they are not negative if they really help to to set up the company or to make the company fit again for the future. But if reorganizations take place around people, around around certain departments to shift power, then again we are at the same point as 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 not allowing certain discussions because you just highlight certain people, certain departments, you you encourage short term risks and then we are back again in destroying the company value. Yes, and if you start reorganizing and changing direction every year, which actually was happening and we have to, if we had this running gag, if if let's bet when is the next organization uh, gonna reorganization gonna happen and ultimately there was no need to bet because it was kind of a certain event. That's true. So um if you if you keep changing the strategy and the course, it's very dangerous because what people start they cannot complete. So you kind of really get completely you lose the motivation to give your best because you know that you're not going to bring it to an end. You're not going to see the results. And you know that most probably some months down the road, this initiative is going to come to an end in the middle of, you know, of making it working. And those are very dangerous tendencies in particular because it costs, it demotivates entirely people. And um, long term, you can't produce any reasonable result with that. And it creates a very political environment as well. And the political environment is also draining. So it costs a lot of time for people. They don't know in which direction they should run. And it's it's very often the outcome not, is not in the best interest of the bank again. And for me personally, this was also the reason why I left Credit Suisse some years ago, because I didn't want to have this waste of time in politics I want to have an environment where I can be productive again, where I can spend 99% of my time in something productive, in something building up. And Same here. <laughs> it's, very, it's very nice when you wake up and know why you're waking up and what you've done by the end of the day. And um, I absolutely can only support it with similar rationale in my case. <laughs> Somehow it also makes me a bit sad looking back now what yeah. happened with Credit Suisse because both of us, we, we spent multiple years there. And in my case, I did my first internship after my high school and before university with Credit Suisse. I, I always worked with Credit Suisse during my studies and then I, I worked for Credit Suisse full time for many years. And I'm very grateful also to this company because I learned a lot. I met um, plenty of, of good people people and friends among others, Luba and, and I, we met at Credit Suisse. So it's for me, these are sad days and sad to see what happened, but also kind of very grateful of what we can build up with you, Mushroom, and hopefully also to, to work on an alternative banking system in the end. This is indeed our goal, how to reshape the financial industry and actually make sure that the beautiful handcraft of investing really comes into focus as and not politics or scandals or rock star <laughs> behavior of top management. I personally had a lot of issues with the, with the culture which we've been facing in, in banking particularly because, and we can see it also now in the dynamics, right? There used to be these rising stars, there used to be those kind of kings, CEOs, uh, names, and now a lot of them are treated like fallen angels. I don't think that that dynamic is actually very good. And it's never a single person who does the culture. It's actually the biggest challenge. And we are seeing it is that this also as entrepreneurs is to create a culture where actually the collective is in, in, in focus and it's, it's, it should, should be really cherished and nourished and not single personalities. Also in this respect with Credit Suisse, we, we received quite a few questions and also many questions around what happens with the money if a bank goes into a bit of an unstable situation. So we prepared a topic and I believe we are taking that up in our next podcast. Absolutely. Looking forward to see you in the next series. See you then. And if you have any additional questions, just write to hello at youmushroom.com or paste the comments below the podcast. And we are very happy to take that up. And we are very much looking forward to see you next time. Bye bye. Bye. Money. What your bank doesn't tell you. A podcast by You Mushroom.